Welcome, everybody, to Cinema Royale. I am Travis Hobson of PunchDrunkCritics.com. And on this week's show, we are talking about, you can tell what we're talking about because the images are right there behind me. If you're watching, of course, or you're listening, then you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, Infinity Pool and Knock at the Cabins. We're doing two horror movies this week, although they're both, I would say, more along the lines of thrillers than the real horrors. But there are horror aspects to both films, for sure. Uh, if he pulls the latest film from Brandon Cronenberg, this is his third film after Antiviral, which was almost a decade ago, and Possessor, which was a couple of years ago. Um, and Knock at the Cabin is the latest from M. Night Shyamalan, uh, his first since uh, Old, a couple of years ago, which I also liked. I, I think Shyamalan's been on a bit of a roll, personally. Uh, Savant is also a really good show on Apple, I've liked. And uh, yeah, I think he's been doing good stuff. Although I feel like Sean Wan will always be like saddled with, you know, this is the best film he's done in 20 years. Like he says, he's done nothing. Uh, in oh, yeah. like, <laughs> he's no, done nothing discussion. since the Sixth Sense. <laughs> earlier about, and still in my mind, it's it's everything that he did like in the mid 2000s. <laughs> right. right. But I think people like, because he, and for those who don't know, that is, our basically our horror writer, my buddy Ronnie Sharps, is is uh, joining me on this week's show. Seemed appropriate to have him for this. He was went with me to see Knocking the Cabin, and then we both went to see Infinity Pool. My second time seeing Infinity Pool, um, so I wanted to bring him on for this. But uh, but yeah, it's like when it comes to Shyamalan, it's like you know he he did he started off so hot that when he fell into that terrible ditch, you know, like bad movies. Like no one has ever let him forget it. Like, like, right. like he's. It's like no matter what he's done since like the happening, like people act like nothing else came after that. <laughs> right. Well, he fell into that trap of just doing the, the same thing. Had the uh, the build up and then the twist every single yeah. movie. But right after that, it was just ridiculous. <laughs> right. And I feel like one of the things that he's done is like the last two movies he's done have been adaptations. Right. This and old and old. But he's not just done straight adaptations. He's kind of given them his own spin or done like change things as to make them more his, I think. Right. And I noticed that, like I said, I revisited the book right after we saw Knock at the Cabin. But right. I know if you want to touch on that one later, but the uh... Cabin at the End of the World, correct? Yes. By Paul correct. Tremblay. Uh, Tremblay, yeah. 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 So we're already talking about Knock at the Cabin. So we'll just go ahead and keep talking about that. So right. basically, talking about it, we'll go to Infinity Pool because I know we have a lot of. A lot of laughs to share about that movie. Right. Uh, so we'll on Knock in the Cabin, <laughs> which uh, which stars you know Dave Bautista, Jonathan Groff, Ben Aldridge. Uh, I believe the girl's name is Kristen Suey. I probably said her last name wrong. Uh, and right. I've always loved since Landline a few years ago. Uh, and Rupert Grant, who's in Shyamalan's uh, series Savant. And um, uh, I always forget the, the lady's name, the black lady's name. Something oh. good. And I always forget it. It's <laughs> I always forget it because it's a three. It's a three. It's three words. It's like three. Right. Words. And I always Nikki, forget. Nikki Amuka Bird. Thank you, Nikki Amuka Bird. I always forget it. I always want to call her Na- Naomi Aka or something. Like that. <laughs> so whatever. I always get it wrong. But anyway, Not Gonna Cabin is about um, a family of three, a homosexual couple and their their young daughter, uh, who are uh, vacationing in an isolated cabin. Until they are approached by a foursome who tell them that they must kill one of their own in order to prevent the apocalypse. Really simple setup, but a but one that has that is you know rife with with all sorts of different themes and and moral dilemmas and complications and and uh and I went into this not really knowing much about the book. I hadn't read the book or anything like that. So I just went in this looking at it as a, as a Shyamalan film, which I think is one of the things which, like we just talked about that I think is great about what he's been doing is doing stuff that, you know, taking other people's work and, and kind of making it his own thing. And Shyamalan to me is one of the best filmmakers at like really like self-contained thrillers. Uh, this movie takes place largely in, in a sing in the single cabin and t- Shyamalan's so good at like driving up tension. And there's real tension in the standoffs here um, between these two, between these two sides, these ideological opposing sides here. Um, that I was really into it from beginning to end, wondering how exactly it's going to turn out. Like, are we going to see the, the the family give in and sacrifice one of their own for something that could be a fraud? 
And Sean Mullen throws a lot of red herrings out there, too, that I think are fairly effective. The only thing I didn't think that was effective was were some of the flashbacks to the couple's, like, the couple time together. That stuff didn't really work for me as much. Right, but it needs to, to build that, that tension. Yeah, I, I get what it was for. It's, it's to give us, you know, reasons to care about them and also to kind of clue us into their personalities. They're, right. the, the two men are distinctly different in terms of personality. So, and their backgrounds are different. So it, it, it all makes for a fuller story. I get that. But to me, they kind of, even for a movie that's fairly short, it's like a hundred minutes. Yeah. Um, they felt like, like they didn't exactly need to be there. Like, I don't think they necessarily added all that much uh, into our understanding of them. We could have, we could, most of the stuff that we, that they show us, they kind of also explain like during the standoffs. <laughs> so they didn't really actually need some of those flashbacks. And like I was telling you before, I mean, uh, knowing the book inside and out pretty much, it's uh, it was beat for beat, word for word, exact mm-hmm. to the book up until the third act. And oh, wow. I understand okay. I understand what they had to do to make it a little bit lighter at the end. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think it works perfectly by itself. You know, you don't have to know the book to go into that. You know that in the book. It's 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 just works perfect by itself as a Shyamalan movie. Yeah. I really liked uh, Dave Bautista in this as well. I mean, I, I think like there's been a there's a, every time there's a Dave Bautista movie that comes out, or The Rock, uh, you get the discussion about who's the best wrestler turned actor. Conversation always happens, but I think Bautista is far and away the best. Yeah, I, I think we talked the about... best actor turned uh, a wrestler turned actor that I've, that I've ever seen. Right. Better than Cena, he's better than Johnson. Better than Cena's, a lot. Cena's not too far behind, I think. Yeah, with some of the stuff he did in Peacemaker. Cena hasn't had Cena hasn't had to had to show the range right. that Batista's had to do. One of the things I like about his character here is that he's not like he's he's a big bruiser, obviously. He looks the part, but he's I mean his his character's not that. He's a sensitive guy. He's you know, he's a teacher and right, he's a teacher and so forth. He's not he's not mean. In fact, one of the things that makes I think really enhances the tension between the two sides is the fact that the doomsday foursome, they really don't want to be doing what they're doing. No. Like they're actually compelled by something. So it's not like they're they're crooks looking for some sort of like uh payoff or they're fulfilling some sort of scheme or something like that. They're all compelled by something they believe in. And that is, I think, a really key point for the movie. Well, they set the whole thing up with that opening scene with Wen sitting there collecting grasshoppers. Same thing. Dave says something about, you know. Be careful, unscrewing the lid. You don't want to frighten the others before you put the new one in. You know that sort of thing. It's just setting up the whole thing of uh, trying that to keep them contained really, in the cat. Yeah, yeah. they really see that opening scene did it for me too because I was thinking about about her talking about how she was observing them, like observing the grasshoppers, right. and I got this feeling of like God observing like Pete the peep like humanity and like right. watching us and what we do and judging us from the outside. You right. know, I kind of got that. I think that I'm sure that was inten- exactly what they were intending by that, by that, uh, by saying that. But that's that's exactly what I got from it. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, so what 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 aspects of it? I'm I'm curious now. What 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 not to go too much into too deep into the plot, but what like what things are changed like from the book that you could tell? Um, the order of the uh, the intruders' deaths kind of kind of is altered a little bit towards the end. And uh, the book goes a lot darker <laughs> than the movie did um, without spoiling too much. It's kind of left open-ended as to if the world's saved or not. Mm. I kind of feel like, I mean, I kind of feel like it's still kind of open-ended here a little bit. Like True. I know things turn around, you know, at, at a certain point, like I said, we're not going to spoil too much here, right. but I feel like there's still like something hanging in the air there. Um <laughs> You know, so I, I don't know. I don't know. I just expected that we were going to get like a Stephen King type like ending where like we're going to find out something's not quite what we thought. Stephen <laughs> King also has a tendency I, not I to. Always, always see, I always see, I always point to the mist as my favorite. Oh, yeah. Like, like oh, you got to be kidding me type ending. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But Stephen King, he has a tendency to have that kind of thing where the, the movie's great up until a point and then it's like he forgets how to end a book. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, there, there's one scene talking about uh, in the air that there's a, one scene in that movie that that still to this day is bothering me about all my future flights. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're if you're if you're really anxious about flying, this might be a movie to avoid. <laughs> for sure. Now that was that's nightmare fuel right there for sure. Right. I hate that. No, but I, I really enjoyed this though. Now, like I said, I think Shyamalan is is really doing some good stuff right now. Are you a Shyamalan fan? I didn't really we didn't really talk about that. Are you a fan of his or not? Uh, like Six Sense stuff like that when it first came out. Uh, when he hit the happening and beyond that, I kind of fell away, <laughs> stopped like, watching because it was the same thing over and over and over. <laughs> the right. Right. Is and I mean, we, we spoke about that before. It's it's not that I hate his movies. It's just that I don't have a desire to watch them. Yeah, I get that. I get that. I mean, look, the happening will do that to a lot of people. That was <laughs> legendarily bad. I mean, that movie, right. So <laughs> I, I felt the same way about uh, I think the last one that I really dipped my toe in was The Village. I think the village is still pretty good. My it's it's okay. I just I'm not a huge fan. <laughs> but it's also like when you start to see some of the signs of a turn, like, like eh, it's like this is starting to wear thin a little bit. But I think right. like his last couple of movies, he's gotten away from those shock twist endings. Like right. I think he's become very self aware, and right. always, you know. And I think he you can see that not just in the way he does his movies and the movies that he's choosing, but like like his his inevitable like cameo appearance that he always makes in every movie. Like I think he's more self-aware about stuff like that too. So it was kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> no. So knock at the cabin, knock at the cabin uh, opened this weekend. Uh, it, it, it kicked avatar finally out of the top spot after eight weeks, eight weeks, uh, wow. eight weeks. Avatar was number one, uh, knock at the cabin, knocked it out uh, with 14 million bucks, which ain't bad. Old made 16 when it came out, so it's not that much of a difference. You haven't right. seen old, have you? I have not seen old. That was one of the, the ones that's on my list. You should definitely check it out. I, I think it's pretty good, personally. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Vicky Crepes, who's in it. Right. I'm a gigantic fan of hers. So <laughs> yeah, she's hot. But um, but but she's also a really fantastic actress. Um, but yeah, so Knock the Cabin is out there now. It's in theaters. Uh 14 million bucks this week is number one. Uh go check that out. Hours. all right let's talk about another film that came out uh last week uh of course everybody knows i saw it at sundance you've probably read my review if you're listening to this show or watching this show uh, so you know my feelings on infinity pool already uh this is the latest from brandon cronenberg i think it has one of the great premises uh it's it's simple but not simple at all uh alexander skarsgård and cleopatra coleman play a couple a well-to-do couple he plays an author with one hit book they go to this well, one book well one book <laughs> uh, they go to this third world country stay at a resort to give him some ideas on the next book and uh they meet a couple played by mia goth i forget the other guy's name he plays her husband doesn't really matter uh she's the ch- ch- catalyst for everything that happens anyway right. <laughs> uh, and they become friends uh they go out outside the borders of the, of the resort where they're not supposed to uh scars guards character accidentally runs over a local man and rather than go to jail, they have this 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 insane way to uh, to enact punishment. Sort of, uh, they have they can clone you, and your clone will will be uh, murdered by the family of the of the victim, <laughs> which is just crazy. Uh, but it's a way. Of course, it costs a hell of a lot of money, and this is the way that the place that the country you know stays afloat. And of course, it's a corrupt corrupt regime, corrupt uh, police force. All that stuff's corrupt. So they're just all getting wealthy off these off these rich white people doing whatever they want to do and having no consequences, which is ultimately what the movie is about. <clears throat> it's about people having no consequences and the extremes that they will go uh, when there are no consequences. But there are a lot of other things going on in this movie, too. And <clears throat> Cronenberg is definitely his father's son in some aspects. I think he's a little bit more cerebral than David Cronenberg personally. Uh, he is I, after three movies i i think that's the way I've, i'm looking at him right now he's a little bit more cerebral but this movie goes into some wild areas sex yeah. orgies <laughs> uh all sorts of other <laughs> clone on clone violence or man on clone violence all sorts of stuff man this movie is absolutely insane and mia goth who i think is the best actress working today anyway is off the fucking chart here she is she has my favorite scene of the year. It's going right. to be my favorite scene at the end of the year for sure. <laughs> and my favorite single line of the movie, 
which it's not even it, it seems like it's a throwaway line but if you if you understand Alexander Skarsgård's character her saying it is just like it cuts deeper than like any knife <laughs> <laughs> like, like, like a, I have to watch it again right now and be very happy oh me too me too I, I love Mia Goth and X this just took it to that next level I mean she is amazing in this yeah yeah she's great talk to me about what you liked about the movie uh, the movie itself, I mean, I'm not too familiar with Brandon Cronenberg. Like I told you, uh, Possessor, I think, was the last one I saw. Um, but I can definitely see hints of his father in his work. Um, a few of those cut scenes yeah. got pretty uh, out there. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, just all in all, I, I love the movie. Just to see how the further they go with this cloning, they lose a little bit more of themselves every time. And just how far they'll go is just insane. I could definitely watch this one again a couple times. Yeah, I think there's. I think every time you watch it, there's going to be something new to think about. Right. There's a scene where there's um like a uh, a feral version of Skarsgård's character that we see. And I was, yeah. and this time I was watching. The last time I was watching it with, with you and uh and our other friend, um, I was watching and I was like, well, I wonder, like, is that a clone? who never had a personality imprinted on him or is he one who has he's undergone the cloning so so many times that he's just now he's just feral he's just this is like this is all that comes out of it now like he's just that's it well, it I could was, also be so many things that it could be well in part it could be that the drug that they imbibed in you know it's yeah. uh it's one of those things that you could see scars guards original well yeah. what you think is his original character getting further and further along with the uh getting into the the feral mode as he as he smokes more and more of this stuff yeah <laughs> yeah i mean this movie, like i mean jesus christ this movie is the best <laughs> humiliation scene ever it's uh it's just it's hard to look at scars guard the same I, like exactly. we're talking about with with the northman he's a completely different person this one it's just it's sad you have to look away yeah it's so <laughs> it's so painful to see this this physical physical guy this guy who like, Although at the beginning of the movie he doesn't really have a lot of confidence, but no. but but that's part of the, that's part of the whole deal because you know, he gains that confidence like throughout the movie, you know he kind of <laughs> gains it, but it's it's he gains it through like <laughs> false pretenses. <laughs> yeah, he gain, gains the confidence just going to pull the rug out from under him. It's it's a beautiful scene that scene on the car. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, Infinity Pool! It's just this movie is such a blast, man. I, how much I, is it? How much is it done uh, in the in the box office so far? I mean, it doesn't uh, seem like it'd be a hot no. Pick, I don't. I it didn't. It didn't rank. Really? Oh wait, no. It, well, it, it was in the top ten last week. Okay. It was in the top ten last week. Let me, let me take that back because I forgot it's been. It came out last week, not this week. But it, it, it was in the top ten last week. Which I, you know, I think at the time when I did my did the box office, I was like, yeah, all the Cronenberg fans who are super excited for this movie because honestly, this year it's the movie that I've been asked about the most. Right, the entire time yeah. I was at Sundance, it was the movie that people kept asking me, had I seen it yet? Had I seen it yet? And you know, tell us about it when you go after you've seen it. So it's the most movie. It's the movie that I've been talked about, uh, asked about the most. So I knew that there was, and, and horror is not generally my bag. So I don't surround myself with a bunch of people who love horror for the most <laughs> part. But people were excited for this. What and are the? Uh, I knew that there was going to be a lot of people that went to see it on the opening weekend, and they did. And then no one else went to see it, though, which is what you know I kind of knew was going to happen. Is there a huge difference between the uh, the one that we saw and the NC seventeen version? No, the version that the version that I saw it on this was NC seventeen. This is the R cut. Although they're apparently going to release the NC seventeen cut at some point, there wasn't a huge difference that I could see other than a couple of scenes. Uh, if you really want to see Scars Guards junk, uh, <laughs> the NC seventeen version is the, is the right. one to do. <laughs> like the girl at the Alamo who was super excited to know they right. had it in, the, in the uncut version. <laughs> but even even the R version was a pretty hard R. So yeah, it doesn't change much. A lot of the shots are the same. Uh, I think there may be one other scene that was mildly altered. Um, which you know, kind of a sex psychedelic orgy sort of thing going on. I think some shots in there were taken out, uh, maybe or shot or shown a little bit differently, but right. otherwise, it's almost it's almost the same. He didn't change much. 
Yeah, there's a there's a portion that I had to look away just because of the uh, the disorienting effect of how he flashes through that sex orgy scene. Yeah, if for those who don't know, it gives you a warning before the movie about the strobing effects and what they can do. So that warning was there at Sundance too. So, uh, so yeah, uh, and I, I can see why. I actually kind of like closed my eyes and like blinked really heavy during that during a couple. Right. Of days. Oh. Yeah, I can see why. <laughs> if I was right. that guy probably wouldn't come in here. <laughs> right. At points, it's hard to tell what you're looking at half the time. So <laughs> I know, I know. But man, this movie is so much fun. I, I can't wait until it, until they took out the NC-17 because I'm going to go back into a theater and watch it again. That's what I'm going to do. That's like uh, what was that last one we did that for the extended cut for Midsummer? Yes, yes. And that was your first time seeing Midsummer was the extended cut, which is by far the superior cut. Yeah. Well, no, actually, I think that was my second time because I did see it. Uh, I think I saw the critic screening of it. If I'm not mistaken. It, it's everything kind of blurs together after a yeah, while. No, the first time you saw it, because I remember we talked about it, the first time you saw it was that cut, and I told you you need to go back and or yeah. it's like this cut. This oh, I didn't know at the time, but this which version was going to be better, right? Um, but yeah, the extended cut that we saw is definitely better. I did see it before that. I actually took my son to go see it because I remember I missed like the first 10 to 15 minutes of it. I missed yeah, a yeah. pivotal scene in the first yeah. 10 to 15 minutes because yeah. I arrived late. Then. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, uh, that extended cut. I remember that. Those I've seen it like 10 times since then. It's one of those uh, those ones that makes my cut every year in October. Yeah. That's great. It's a great movie. Uh, and, and Infinity Pool is going to be on that list for me of movies that yeah. Definitely revisit <laughs> every now and then when I need a Mia Goth fix. Yeah. <laughs> go right they got, she's got, uh, they're working on Maxine now, aren't they? Yep. Yep. So, uh, I don't think it has a date yet or anything, though, but yeah, I'm excited for that too. There's not many uh, movies that I buy like the Steelbook collector's editions of, but definitely that trilogy is going to be one. Yeah, they've done a fantastic job. I really like Ty West, I always have. I mean, I do. I, uh, how, was it? House of the Devil was my first introduction to Ty, and uh, yeah. yeah, me too. And then I like the Innkeepers a lot. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of his, and this is this is a great movie right here. Um. I mean, well, his movies that he's done with me at Goth have been great, and Infinity Pool is great too. I can't wait to see what Brandon Cronenberg does, does next. He'll probably take it to Sundance because he's all three of his movies have debuted there. So and hopefully, yeah. After- this there's not another 10 year gap or eight year gap or whatever it was between uh his first movie and possessor yeah i know right i think he's i think whatever was going on then he's over that i feel like he's probably going to be like a movie every two or three years kind of guy now so but then he's 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 landed on something great with infinity pool i heard a lot of people who didn't like it you know i heard some people like like I, i think i told you a story when i was in line for another movie a critic uh friend of mine walked past me and was like I guess you could hear me. He's like, I don't know what the fuck you were laughing at in that movie. Because <laughs> it's dark and terrible. And I don't know what you were laughing at. And I, I, I told him, I was like, if you can't laugh at how ridiculous this guy's situation is, then I got no help for you, man. This movie's, well, this movie's right. insane. Like, I mean, come on. It's ridiculous. It's yeah. great. <laughs> it's great how ridiculous this guy's situation is. It's awesome. So... Yeah, it, it definitely goes places you don't expect it to go. Definitely. I suggest people, who, if they can, to go in as cold as possible without knowing too, too much. Yeah, I mean, I went into it completely cold. Like, I had, hadn't even read your review of it. I just went in completely cold, and, and I was pleasantly surprised. Our friend who went with us, um, uh, she had she knew nothing about it either. And uh, she can't stop raving about how good it is. <laughs> That's been the, the way I've been operating lately is I try to avoid every trailer I can and just go in completely cold on these movies. Yeah. Because, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, especially with horror, you know that. They, they put 90% of the, the best cuts of the movie in the trailer. Yeah. Yeah. See, I'm more inclined to go and see a movie like this than I am to go see, like, Halloween. I, I've seen none of the new Halloween movies. Like, I, I haven't either. <laughs> You're not alone with that. I haven't either. Yeah. So I it's one of those things. That, it depends on the mood I'm in. You know, um, Lately, it's been more of the psychological stuff like uh, Infinity Pool and things like that that I've been going for. But uh, certain times of the year, I like to go back to the uh, the buckets of blood type of stuff from the 70s right. and 80s. <laughs> and uh, there's a few directors out there that are still doing that. So <laughs> I'm excited for, for them making the Thanksgiving movie now. I am too. I'm kind of curious. It's Eli Roth, right? Yeah. I'm excited yeah, for but... that because I post that video every year on Thanksgiving. <laughs> so I, 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 I've been wanting to see that movie happen for a long time. 
there's not many Thanksgiving horror movies. I mean, the, the closest they came to that was the uh, the Bruce Campbell one that I, I did review for last year. It was uh, Black Friday. Oh, yeah. Wow. I forgot about that. That was more of a, a sci-fi horror thriller type of thing. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. There aren't very many Thanksgiving horrors. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, all right. So, everybody, thanks, everybody, for tuning in to Cinema Royale. Uh, thanks again to Ronnie Sharp for joining me for this one. Ronnie, you got a couple of reviews coming up. Uh, in the next couple of weeks, uh, you yeah, know, tell people about those without reviewing them. Just what you got coming up? Uh, this week I'm doing a um, shutter release. It's a, Den- a movie from Denmark called Attachment, um, basically based in Jewish folklore. Um, I got that one coming out this week, and then uh, I believe The Lair is following that one pretty pretty close after that. I'm not really sure. And then Children of the Corn next month. So right, Children of the Corn. I feel like I sent you an email about another one. Maybe I think I you did. Um, Everything uh, with the screeners coming in from from Shutter, it's been kind of hard to keep track of all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. She came from the woods. I think is the other one. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, I can't that one that. Horror, horror comedy. I don't really know the premise. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, oh, it sounds just like uh, everything else from the eighties. You know, summer camp type of thing. <laughs> yes, that's right. Now I'm remembering it. Yeah, I remember it. Okay. Yeah. So there's another one for you. So yeah. Ronnie's Ronnie's uh, taking over most of the the, the horror stuff for us, which is good because I don't want to do it, and uh, <laughs> who does want to should do it. So <laughs> Ronnie's that <right. laughs> and I'll watch pretty much anything you throw at me. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks Ronnie for co- tuning in uh, for coming on uh, Cinema Royale, and thanks to all of you for ju- for tuning in to Cinema Royale. I'm Travis Thompson, the PunchDrunkCritics.com. You can find me there every single day, and you can find me in loads of other places here in DC. You don't, I'm not going to go down the list. Thanks everybody. I will see you next week. Goodbye. Thanks for checking out the show. If you like what we're laying down, please subscribe to our channel and click the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest stuff.